you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Exodus 2. We're going to read a passage this morning that complements the other two passages you've heard. First from Exodus 2 and then from Matthew 2. And we're going to read starting in Exodus 2, 16. By the way, I just want to thank God publicly for having a voice this morning. It's a little different from last week. Exodus 2, 16. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters... And they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came to home to their father, he said, how is it you, that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that may, he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now turn to the New Testament, the very first book, to Matthew 2. We'll start with verse 13. You don't know how much good it does a minister to hear those pages turning while you're standing up here. It's just like manna falling from heaven. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he, Joseph, rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. These are the words of God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of everyone within earshot of this service, whether here or present in another way, be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Morning's message is entitled Sojourner in a Foreign Land. Have you ever been a sojourner? Chances are excellent that you have. A sojourner is a fancy word for saying you're a temporary resident. Sojourners are college students staying in dorms. Sojourners are infantrymen in tents or barracks. Sailors on board ships. Missionaries working far afield from their homes. Sojourner just means temporary visitor. Add to it in a foreign land and you have a familiar biblical concept. The Hebrew word, gur, that we usually translate as sojourner or sometimes stranger, occurs about 160 times in scripture as either a noun or a verb. It's used a lot because it's common in scripture for people to find themselves in a temporary place. In the book of Exodus, Moses has spent the first chapter of his life as a sojourner in the land of Egypt, where he is Pharaoh's adopted prince. He doesn't know he's a sojourner. He thinks he's home. As time passes, he realizes that what God has in store for him, and in the second chapter of his life, banished from Egypt, Moses finds himself in the region of Midian, he goes to work for Jethro, the priest of Midian. Moses marries Jethro's daughter, and their first son is called Gershom, meaning sojourner in a foreign land. And as you know, Moses was to experience a couple more pretty significant chapters in his life. He was not done with either sojourning or doing so in a foreign land. God had a lot in store for Moses. Well, as I said, sojourning is a common biblical theme. Look at Abraham. He was the king of the sojourners. 
He moved from the land of Ur. What a name for a town, Ur. To a nomadic life, which would eventually bring him to the land of Canaan. His grandson, Jacob, would later flee to another land after stealing his brother's birthright. The Bible's full of these really sweet people, isn't it? When famine came, Jacob's family of origin ended up in Goshen, right outside the Egyptian capital, more sojourning. This time it lasted about 400 years. As God's people became enslaved to the Egyptians, but it was still God's people sojourning in a foreign land. King David spent a lot of time knocking around. It was a dozen years between his appointing, anointing, and assuming the throne as king. The prophet Elijah spent about as much time running away to the wilderness and the desert as he did trying to wake up the nation of Israel. The Israelites didn't just wander through the Exodus years, they were also later exiled to Babylon, far from home for several generations. It seems that in many instances, sojourning in a foreign land was a way of life for God's people. But as you might say, that was the Old Testament. It was different in the New Testament, wasn't it? Things began to settle down. Not really. <laughs> yes, many of God's people were back in Israel. But that only tells part of the story. For instance, the book of Matthew reports that after Jesus was born, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. There they found out that Jesus had been born in Bethlehem, and they traveled there finding Jesus in a house, not in a manger. The nativity scene we display every year has the characters right, but probably not the timing. The wise men, or magi as they were called, came later, probably months later, maybe more, that's why Herod had all the male children under two years of age killed. He thought Jesus was sure to have been in that group. But as you know, Jesus wasn't at home for Herod's assassins. Joseph had been warned by an angel and Jesus and his family had fled quickly to Egypt about 90 miles or so down the road where they stayed until Herod died. So Jesus began his life as a sojourner in a foreign land. Even when they returned, they started over in a new town where they were not known. Where did the great apostle Paul live? On the road. How about Philip? Try Africa. The same is true for so many of Jesus' disciples. They found themselves sojourners in a foreign land for the sake of the gospel. My first church was a 71 mile commute, one way to the South Carolina Sand Hills. Over time the church grew and I found it necessary to stay overnight once or twice a week. And a congregant let me stay in a tree house on the property of one of her farms. I kid you not. It was a really cool tree house. I spent a night or two every week in the treehouse, and he came down once in a while. I thought that qualified as sojourning. But I didn't know then that God would call, later call me 500 miles north. God really does have a sense of humor. But God is also kind and shows us grace. Though he called me far from my home he gave me the shortest commute in my ministry. <laughs> From door to door, it's about a two minute walk. As great a commitment it is to leave your home or familiar surroundings and strike out for some unfamiliar place, it's just as great a commitment, indeed the ultimate act of obedience, to stay right where you are but change your circumstances. Change your allegiance. Want to try it out? Want to see what it's like to be a sojourner in a foreign land? Just try to follow Jesus. 
You can stay home and find yourself living in a world where your savior and the gospel are like a foreign concept, a foreign land to those around you. First, you might want to take an inventory. Is there anything you might have to change? Look at what you have. Let's just take a quick tour of the average person in this community. You would say you're pretty average probably. You're certainly not rich, but you're certainly not poor either. Okay. Do you own a car? Jesus didn't. You can say, well, of course Jesus didn't own a car. They weren't invented at the time of Jesus. But horses and camels and donkeys were, and he didn't own one of those either. Do you own your own home? Jesus didn't. How many pairs of shoes do you own? I'm not going to ask my wife that question. Jesus owned one pair of sandals. How many changes of clothes sit in your closet unworn for months or even years? Jesus owned one robe. How do you support God's church? Do you give money? The widow Jesus saw at the temple gave a mite. I bet you've never given that much. That's less than a penny. It's also a fortune for it's all she had. How much time do you give each week? An hour? Two? Five? There are 168 of them in a week. Paul gave his life to God and paid his way as a tent maker to boot. Now, my point is not to disparage anyone. I'm the guiltiest of all. We all fall short of Jesus, and we already know that. My point is this. Jesus showed us the way to live in this world with our eyes on the kingdom. It's very difficult to live here and keep your eyes on the prize. We're constantly being told by every message on every billboard in every newspaper or magazine in every TV commercial that we need to be taller and thinner and prettier that we can do so if we just use the right drugs or wear the right clothes or drive the right cars. The idols the media promotes are bachelors and bachelorettes and quarterbacks and singers. Even when religion is front and center, it often revolves around the bigness of the ministry, the size of the purse. If we can manage to turn away from such massive promotion, such a penetrating social message, then we will have a chance to see the road to which Jesus is pointing us. But if we do, we will indeed find ourselves sojourners in a foreign land. Almost everything in our society points in another way. A selfish way. But Jesus is calling too. We live with one foot. I know this is a hand. It's a metaphor. We live with one foot balanced precariously in the reality of place, of the here and now, of time and space, and yes, consumerism. But where will we place our other foot? As Christians, we must reach. We must thrust that other foot into the spiritual land that day by day, hour by hour, and as we do so, it begins to make us realize that the earthly ground on which we walk is quicksand. It's only the firm ground of the cross where reality really exists. That's where we find home. That's where we can hang up the shoes of the sojourner and take our rest. The Apostle Paul writing to the Roman church encouraged them to present themselves as living sacrifices acceptable, not to their friends or coworkers 
or classmates, but to God. He entreated them to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of their minds to discern the will of God and then do it. He was asking them to do what Jesus alluded to in the 17th chapter of John, praying to God during the Passion Week. Jesus asked God to let his disciples be in this world, but not of it. I was talking to my daughter, Emily, a few months ago. She was trying to decide whether to renew a lease for another year near where we live. Emily has spent half her adult life in Africa, and sometimes being in the United States is just plain hard for her. She's seen too much. And as she was talking about her choices, she just stopped and remarked, this is not our home. And that stopped me in my tracks. I looked at her and I realized that she was somewhere else. She wasn't talking about her lease. She wasn't even talking about America or Africa. She was talking about Earth. This is not our home. What does Paul mean? What does Jesus mean? What does my daughter mean? Jesus tells us. Jesus goes on to say that he's sending his disciples into the world, into the world, not withdrawing them from it, he asked God for their protection from evil, not for a place to hide. I think the message here is that we're always to be guided by Christ, by God's grace. That we're always to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We Christians, listen now, we Christians are the answer. We just need to keep reminding the world of what the questions are. Yes, if we are Christians, then we are called upon to be sojourners, temporary residents in a foreign land. It's a land full of temptation, ripe with idols, loaded with pressure from all around us to conform to its ways, but we know better. It's only temporary. Why should we do such a thing? Why should we make such a commitment? Why should we make life so difficult? The world beckons to us to make more money, buy more possessions. Why should we make it so hard on ourselves with all this Christianity stuff? Don't be misled. Hard can be good, even easy. Jesus promises us that his yoke is easy and his burden light. Even while we sit at home surrounded by family, relaxed in all our earthly rituals, we're just sojourners passing through this place on the way to eternity. The place we live, the space we occupy, it's only temporary. We cannot find real and lasting stability on such a foundation. It just can't hold but so long. That's true whether we believe in the gospel or not. We can't avoid earthly death and we cannot avoid, avoid eternity. We can only choose how eternity will look for us. We can find that stability in Jesus. We can find that foundation in him. Yes, we too will become sojourners in a foreign land, but we will not be alone. The Holy Spirit lives within us, always tenderly calling us to our real home. There's nothing temporary about Jesus. Where do you stand and how will you serve? William Bradbury wrote a hymn in 1863 that expresses it well for us. On Christ the solid rock we stand. All other ground 
is sinking sand. There's Christ and there's all other ground. So where will you stand? Can we pray together? Dear Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, you told us all we need to know. You've given us all the guidance we need to get. We have choices to make. Choices bigger than just showing up for church on Sunday. We have choices to make about our lives, our whole lives, not just the ones we spend temporarily here. Dear Father, send your Holy Spirit inside us deep. and Quicken us to the pace of our Lord. Help us to hear that still, small voice that beckons us to come home. And may we live toward that goal. In Christ's precious name, we pray these things. Amen.